Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to RightsCon 2021. Wow, 10 year anniversary, right? Time flies. 10 year, yeah. <laughs> it does, it does. I've only been to four RightsCon, so not the 10th, but still been a, quite an experience. I think I've been to six, but we have this internal thing in the Access Now team and also with some partners in which we bet how much, how many rights cons have we made. Um, so yeah, time flies. So, um, as, how do you do? I am Javier Paliero, Policy Director at Access Now, and I want to ask here my colleague Melody, who is going to introduce herself, what is the main thing that has you most excited about this year's RiceCon? Thank you, Javi. So, yes, I'm Melody, uh, I'm Advocacy Director at Access Now. And this year, I'm particularly excited about the diversity of sessions. And my challenge to myself is to go to a session that has nothing to do with the issues that I'm familiar with. Um, and then another thing that I'm pretty excited about is uh, the yoga sessions, the, the, the <laughs> yoga at RightsCon. So I'll be looking forward to that, especially after intense panels and intense strategy sessions, I think I'll need it. And I guess that we are all so tired, right, about having a year, almost two years of confinement in some places of the world with a lot of meetings and calls online. So uh, I think that some yoga is going to be uh, very handy um, for all of us. And in, in, for me, the most exciting part of the, of the meeting is going to be the opportunity that we have to get uh, people together in the same room, uh, especially, you know, uh, big names at companies. We have, we have great fireside chats. And uh, it's an opportunity for the community to hold, for example, companies accountable, right? And getting the people there in the in the in the meeting to ask questions directly. So that's really really cool. I'm mean, also a really a bit of, of a fanboy of Cory Doctorow, who's going to have a fireside chat later today with an Argentinian activist that is also a friend. So that's my little uh, fanboy uh, indulgence that I'm going to have today. Yes, well, it's true that even today, actually, the program is quite rich. And without further ado, we're going to hand over to Nikki, uh, RightsCon director, who are going to tell you more about everything RightsCon related. Over to Our you. hero. Zero. <laughs> Thank you, Javi. Thank you, Melody, for that very kind introduction. My name is Nikki Gladstone, and as RightsCon director with Access Now, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our 10th anniversary summit. It's fitting that our 10th anniversary event is a record-breaking year across the board. This year, we're hosting more sessions, 527, more participants, 8,515, and more countries, 164, than ever in our history. But what's even more remarkable, and what I would like to take a moment to celebrate, is the community in those numbers. All of you who, while having been disrupted by the online transition, have not been weakened by it. Instead, we've seen unprecedented solidarity in protecting and extending this new place, this new space that we're calling home for RightsCon. We use the words community often, and we do it intentionally because whether it's your 10th RightsCon or your fourth like mine or your first, the impact of what we can all achieve in this space isn't confined to the five days um, that are ahead of us. For some of you, those five days are a starting point, and for others, it's a continuation and deepening of work ongoing. If it is your first RightsCon, which it is for an extraordinary 67% of you, welcome, because you being here is part of what I believe to be one of the best things about this community, its willingness to expand and its willingness to include. Three years ago, our program hosted very few sessions on the environment, indigenous rights, on health. Now they are themes that intersect across every program track. Whatever issue attracted you here, or even if there is an issue you're bringing to our agenda for the first time, this is a welcoming platform to move forward your work, both this week and in the future. We're proud of this year's program because it's rich in content and purpose, as Melody mentioned. No matter which way you cut it, whether it's the 16 program tracks, 10 intersecting themes, seven formats, or six languages, there's a lot of work to be done here. And I also hope, as we all roll up our sleeves and get ready to do that work, that everyone takes a moment to connect to. One of the biggest pieces of feedback that we got out of RightsCon last year when we moved it online was a desire for us to recreate the hallway experiences of our in-person events. We haven't been able to reproduce the feeling of running into someone familiar in the hallway between sessions, but we have taken a crack at building meaningful connections in online environments. 
You can message another participant at any time during RightsCon using our chat feature across and across the program. You'll find open spaces that are designed specifically for building your personal community within ours. As a parting note, I want to take a moment to thank the other members of the RightsCon team who have put their whole hearts into bringing the RightsCon program and platform to life. I know you've met them over many emails and in trainings and on calls, but I hope you will join me in thanking them this week. Sarah, Daphne, Ariana, Michelle, Luis, Adriana, thank you. Now it is my pleasure to pass it to Brett Solomon, Executive Director of Access Now, to reflect on 10 years of RightsCon. Thank you Thanks so much, Nikki. Uh, and thanks to Javier and Melody as well. Uh, it's, it's great to see you guys online. I must admit, it's... Um, a shame that we don't get to hug and see each other in person um, like we do, which is the annual meeting as well of the Access Now team. But I would like to welcome everybody, as Nikki has, to the 10th iteration of RightsCon, especially those of you who are here for the first time. Um, by the end of Friday, there will have been 23,381 experts, activists and policymakers um, who have participated in RightsCon over the last 10 years. Um, from 400 participants when we first started and in 2011 to 8,500 um, in this edition. But as Nikki said, it's not just a question of, um, of numbers, it's actually a question of who. Um, so we've had activists and anarchists and foreign ministers and CEOs and high commissioners and special rapporteurs and celebrities and the nameless. Um, we have people participating from pretty much every country in the world over these last 10 years. And um, I think as many, uh, as, many as, you know, as many of you know, we actually are equally as interested in, in uh, empowering the grassroots as we are in holding the powerful accountable. And I think that's one of the reasons why we've had uh, over a thousand session proposals from the global community in 2021. Um, so what's happened over these 10 years? Uh, we've, we've developed norms like the Toronto Declaration on AI. Uh, we've launched movements, including the Keep It On Coalition to stop internet shutdowns. And I will say that the definition of a shutdown was actually um, language that was crafted in a half day multi-stakeholder meeting at RightsCon. And that language has ended up in every UN resolution since. Um, We've kickstarted campaigns like YID, calling for rights respecting identity systems, and ban, hashtag ban BS, pushing for the banning of biometric recognition technologies in all publicly accessible spaces. And you'll see a lot about that this week. Um, we've mobilized through the Arab Spring and its aftermath, uh, through the Edward Snowden revelations, including having him speak here in, uh, in, at RightsCon in 2016. We've grappled with the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal and the impact of misinformation on the US elections and beyond. And we've also celebrated a lot of victories. I don't know how many of you remember the shouts of joy at RightsCon Southeast Asia when the Indian Supreme Court struck down Section 66A of the Information Technology Act, which was used to arrest um, bloggers and critics online. Um, we also know that we haven't necessarily won that victory forever and there'll be some information about that and some private meetings uh, on the situation uh, in India, which is deteriorating. But together at RightsCon, we've determined that digital rights are actually human rights in the digital age. That the corridor is as important as the stage and that getting culture right is as essential as getting strategy in place. We've also learned that a crowdsourced program is better than a is better than a centralized one. This year, the 10th anniversary of RightsCon is also the 10th anniversary of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And I think that they permanently change the way that we talk about corporate accountability. And it takes us back to where we started at RightsCon with the Silicon Valley Human Rights Conference. I myself have all been to all 10 uh, RightsCons. Uh, but that began in San Francisco in 2011. And we can see from what's happening in India to Colombia to Palestine and in a world of increased inequality, digital authoritarianism and institutional crisis that the Silicon, the Silicon Valley business model needs more than a tinkering at the edges. It needs an overhaul. 
So for the third straight year, the UN Special Procedures Coming to Rights kind of issued a joint statement um, that was released um, on Friday which is marking the occasion, or maybe on, on Sunday, yesterday. Um, this year, more than ever, we have nine rapporteurs who emphasise that the, dig the digital rights must be prioritised to rebuild civic space amid recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. But as you know, these threats that we are facing to digital rights have been under attack since way before the pandemic. It's an old story and it stirs with greater intensity each year. We see it on our digital security helpline, uh, which just this month will have completed its 10,000th case in response to technical attacks and vulnerabilities facing civil society. Please read our report that we're releasing today uh, on those 10,000 cases. It is full of information and analysis. And here, as I do each year, I would like to call for the release of Allah Abdel Fattah, who left RightsCon in 2011 to face an Egyptian tribunal back home and has been in prison pretty much ever since. Uh, as his cousin wrote to me yesterday, Allah is a thinker that not just Egypt, but the whole world is being deprived of. A person who, were he not in prison, would have helped us shape the new as we transition from the era that we're in to the era that we're moving into. And such global convulsions that we're experiencing have thrust new topics onto our agenda. We've come to, to scrutinise the intersection of public health, uh, data, data collection, disinformation and technology, and explore the ways to bring the power of the digital rights movement to the climate crisis. I also want to note that we've made mistakes um, and we've been required to look in the mirror on gender, on race, on how to recognise arbitrary power. All of these things are questions that we consider deeply and hopefully evolving on as a community and also at RightsCon. I'm really pleased that over 60% of session proposers um, this year identify as women. That's an extraordinary percentage at a tech conference. And it's even higher if you look at the sessions by those who identify as non-binary or third gender. And through all of this, RightsCon has maintained its heart. I think many people see RightsCon as a home or a place that they can call home, and others see, others see it as a place to meet the people that they could only ever aspire to work with. And yet others, perhaps largely companies and governments, can't wait for it to be over, to please stop the demands for accountability and transparency. And I joke on that, but I'm actually serious because I want to send a shout out to the 500 companies and 55 governments who are here uh, at RightsCon during this week. We've never seen such numbers. And I want to send a negative shout out to those that are not here. But regardless of stakeholder group, collectively, we are improving, we're evolving, and I think that RightsCon makes our global community even stronger. More than anything, RightsCon makes human rights more likely to be enjoyed in the digital age. And after all, what better outcome could we be looking for than that? So thanks to Nikki. Uh, and her amazing team for what looks to be an extraordinary and even overwhelming week ahead. And respect to the 10 years of RightsCon directors and legends, including Yochai Benavi, Ryan One Street, Nick D'Agostino, Eric Lovecchio and Abby Watson, who have worked on RightsCon over this decade. And finally, I would like to use this platform to lord the Access Now team, who are the smartest, most committed and most united team I've ever worked with. Our mission as founders and hosts of RightsCon is to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk all year, every day, not just at or via RightsCon. So as they say on the, on the digital security helpline, don't panic, we're on it. And with that, I'd like to introduce our panel. So if we could get them up on screen, that would be great. Uh, nice to see you all. Uh, you are live. So Hadi, uh, perhaps you could wave, is the executive director of Mnemonic and the founder of Syrian Archive. He's also just been recognised as Time Magazine's one, uh, one of the 100 most uh, influential people to shape uh, this coming generation. So welcome to Hadi. 
Uh, we also have Dr. Teleng, uh, also known as Dr. T, uh, if you could wave for us as well. She is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health. Incredible job that you have, and thank you very much for joining us. I can only imagine how busy you are in the midst of the pandemic. And I also, we also have uh, the Senior Vice President for Strategy and External Relations at Telnor, uh, Rita, who is here. And it's so great to see you. And thank you also for joining. Uh, obviously, a very, very busy time for you as one of the telecoms that's responsible for telecommunications in Myanmar uh, in the midst of the coup. Again, all three of you, great to see you. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand over to Hardy to make a few remarks, uh, then to Telang and then to Rita and we'll have some conversation in between. Uh, so, uh, Hadi, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Berik. I thank you so much also for having me here today on behalf of Mnemonic. It's an honor to be part of such an amazing program uh, and also to share this opening ceremony with an inspiring group of human rights defenders from throughout the world who are working tirelessly to advance uh, human rights. Today, I will be emphasizing the impact of collaboration and solidarity that I have experienced in the last 10 years working on archiving and verifying human rights documentation in Syria with the Syrian Archive Project at the start and then globally with uh, the organization Mnemonic. Um, this year not only marks 10 years of RightsCon, but also spread to many countries in the region and then globally in places including Hong Kong, Ethiopia, Belarus and the United States. I also left my country 10 years ago as I had compulsory military service right before the Syrian uprising. I moved to Jordan, where I monitored and documented uh, peaceful protests and then violence against them. Syrians were uploading and sharing thousands of videos and photos they have captured documenting states' violations to social media platforms for the world to witness what was happening. And this was quite different to what happened in the 80s in Syria, where a huge massacre was committed in Hama, where thousands of people died without much evidence about what happened or who was responsible. 10 years ago, I started work as a digital security trainer for uh, human rights defenders in Syria and other countries, many of whom were working to report violations to advance accountability. Even then, I was told by those I was training that despite mountains of content documenting human rights violations published to social media platforms, much of this vital content was being taken down and disappearing potentially forever. Making matters worse, massive amounts of misinformation about what was really going on made accurate reporting by foreign press, NGOs, and accountability mechanisms who were prevented from being on the ground even harder. I recognize that documentation of social media is valuable to advance accountability and also to memorialize the history of our country. Working with two friends, I founded Syrian Archive in 2014 as a way to collect, preserve, and verify media content to feed into justice and advocacy processes. We had no financial resources, no technical infrastructure, nor the expertise on how to deal with the largest scale of media content in history, documenting human rights violations in real time. And in order to work around these challenges, I reached out for support for the human rights community, many of whom are present here today. With, and with that support, we were able to build our website, develop the archiving software, create initial workflows and methods for this operation. And seven years later, starting from last year and this year, we submitted the first legal complaints to courts in Germany, France, and Sweden about the use of chemical weapons against civilians in Syria. We hoped our experience with the Syria archive would be helpful to lawyers, journalists, and human rights defenders facing similar challenges elsewhere. So we expanded and created Mnemonic to play this supporting role. In 2018, we created the Yemeni Archive, and 2019, the Sudanese Archive, always in collaboration with and led by media groups and human rights defenders from those places. We continue to get requests from human rights groups every week. Last month, for example, my colleague in Sudan was having a meeting with a human rights group from Colombia to share their experience in archiving and verifying documentation that shows, that shows police violence against civilians. This really shows that the issues our organization faces are far from unique, a solidarity-driven approach where groups share resources and methodologies with those facing similar issues elsewhere is more vital than ever before. This year, at the 10th anniversary of RightsCon, a large number of panels will show groups working together to tackle these challenges, develop tools and methods, and better ways 
to collaborate more effectively. My team and myself are looking forward to being part of this vital discussion this year, and thank you so much for having us. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hadi. Um, let me ask you, um, before we, we hand over to, to, to Leng, um, you know, this is obviously a very tra traumatic, uh, ex has been a very traumatic decade for you, very personally um, and, and professionally as well. You've, you, as you say, you know, you left um, Syria 10 years ago um, at, at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the decade fleeing, you know, Syrian conscription. And here you are now, you know, leading this extraordinary organization. And through all of that has been the Arab Spring. And I wonder if you could just spend a moment or two just reflecting where we were at uh, in that arc, and particularly at the intersection of you know political uprising and digital activism. You know what 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 are you what are you what are, what's happening and and how do we um how do we advance this bend the arc towards justice? Absolutely, Red. So. Um... We've seen since 10 years uh, a really important issue when the Arab uh, uprising started from breaking the silence, breaking the fear and, uh, use, and using an activist and human rights defenders using what's available in terms of uh, uh, their devices to capture uh, human rights violations uh, on their cameras and uploading um, the documentation um, on social media. And um, in the case of Syria and in the case of other countries uh, in the region, uh, this still has been the case from 10 years until now. Um, it didn't really matter for people um, what is the political situation is uh, in, uh, in terms of like improving or not. Um, and when we were doing interviews with people that were actually capturing this content, it was a lot about um, keeping the advocacy going for the for the things that they have asked for in the beginning in terms of human rights um, and democracy uh, and equality uh, and better economical situation uh, and not just only that but also a lot of us shared about memorializing the history and making sure that the future generation knows how the Arab Spring went and how governments dealt with it um, uh, and uh, they didn't want uh, any of that to disappear as other events before the before the Arab uprising actually also uh, disappeared uh, with very little documentation. Um, so right now, I mean, what what I see is I see a lot more um, collaboration and solidarity between different human rights groups um, in the region working on very challenging issues uh, in a very uh, challenging uh, in environment, uh, in an environment uh, of uh, impunity, um, lack of effective accountability mechanisms, uh, lack of resources for civil society at large. Um, and from the recent uh, of what's happening in Palestine, we can really see how uh, Palestinian and regional organizations are working collaboratively together to tackle challenging issues uh, around uh, digital rights and around the censoring of Palestinian voices. And it has been done in a very uh, professional way and a very timely way. Um, mm. Thank you. Yeah, okay. we'll talk more about that um, later in the discussion. And in particular, I, I do want to talk to you about or hear from you about the, the, the purpose and the need for archiving of this content. Um, because it's not just about being able to see it in real time. And obviously what's happened, what's happening in Palestine, we've seen when content has been removed in real time and some of the consequences, uh, the real life consequences of that. Um, but also, as you say, like the, the, it's kind of both dispiriting and encouraging at the same time. Um, a lot of the discussions that we're having, you know, because I've looked back over the last 10 years, I looked at the original comments from, from RightsCon back in 2011, and even when Access Now formed back in 2000. And nine, and so much of the conversation is actually the same. You know, it's about how does civil society use the online sphere to be able to advance their their human rights agendas, their political agendas, and who are the gatekeepers, and um, 
you know, whether it be companies or governments, and how does multi-stakeholderism fit together to ensure that we actually deliver human rights online, um, as was, you know, found to be the case through multiple human rights resolutions. Um, so thanks very much. And, and obviously your region is also dealing with a pandemic. Um, so with that, um, and when you intersect, you know, political upheaval with the, the crisis, the health crisis, I think we have, um, you know, a very potent um, and, 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 and unhappy recipe. So with that, let me hand over to, uh, to, uh, to Leng to give us some introductory remarks on um, her area of responsibility. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for the invitation and distinguished guests and all of the panelists. Um, we know that technological and digital developments in the health sector have proven to be instrumental in the promotion of the right to health, the provision of health care, and in many, in many instances, has direct positive impact on our quality of life. Innovation and digital interventions are an integral element to ensuring new capacity and ability to store, share, and analyze health information. At the point of care, they have also increased provider capabilities and, prove, and improved patient access to public health information, health provider information, and available services, all of which have been instrumental in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Because innovation and digital technology are going to keep transforming the provision of healthcare more than any other force, it is important that more investment be directed towards improving innovation and digital technology. Universal access to healthcare services is not possible without policies to ensure affordable access to health technologies. There are, however, legitimate concerns about the human rights abuses that digital technology can enable in the area of healthcare. We must never forget that with any endeavor to improve healthcare and the devices used to deliver it, we are first and foremost dealing with human lives. We are responsible not only for their immediate healthcare needs, but also creating opportunities and eradicating barriers that hinder their access to healthcare. This access is a human right, which intersects with other human rights to which all people are entitled. We must see beyond the technology. Factors that need attention to the execution of equitable digital health include accessibility and affordability. The digital divide in much of the global south and in other developing repertoire on contemporary forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, emerging digital technologies exacerbate and compound existing inequities many of which exist along racial, ethnic, and national origin grounds. This is a serious consideration in the light of the well-established evidence for racism that is so deeply embedded in the global healthcare system in that it makes digital healthcare solutions susceptible to absorbing those same faults. Digital and facial recognition in technologies that are being used in health innovations may perpetuate racism and sexism, ableism, and thereby embedding it in health technology. In my first report, a special repertoire at the UN General Assembly, I addressed this issue head on, and I would like to restate that within my own mission to employ non-discrimination, anti-coloniality, and intersectionality in fulfilling my mandate, we must accept that artificial intelligence is not neutral. Digital and artificial intelligence solutions can be rules-based, open, commercialized, or authoritarian, and they can build on the involvement of citizens, communities, and patients or can be focused on health professionals only. As much as it can do wonders, it can also cause harm, and we must remain vigilant and highly critical of these technologies. While discussing the merits and dangers of digital health solutions, our attentions must not stray from policy. Many decisions and resolutions can be made on this issue, but without strong policy support that prioritizes human rights, efforts may fall short of helping anyone. And I know that many wonderful civil society organizations whose passion for human rights continue to demand accountability and prevent abuse through policy change and remain committed to this ideal. And I would like to state my unwavering support for this work and encourage you all to do the same. If digital healthcare interventions are to serve us all equally, it must be approached from the perspective that real people with diverse needs will be receiving its outcomes. Let it be in a way that improves their quality of life and does not harm them. 
There are opportunities that lie ahead of us if we pay attention to the work being done towards building better systems by those whose lives depend on it. As a global community, we must achieve decolonization and the democratization of the global health architecture. Anti-racism must find expression in policy, practice, resource allocation and spending. Intersectional frameworks must be the backbone of public health in order to bring those in the margins into the center. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Special Rapporteur. I very much appreciate your comments. Uh, it's really quite refreshing and I think quite radical, actually, to have somebody of your stature to talk about these issues of racism and institutional um, inequity in the healthcare system. Um, but um, I actually, just before we, we hand over to Rita, I want to pick up on something that you said, because I, I don't know if the audience actually heard it as closely as I did. Uh, which was you said that digital technologies are going to keep transforming the provision of healthcare more than any other force, right? So digital tech is going to is going to transform the provision of healthcare more than any other force. And might I just add that I think that healthcare, and specifically the pandemic, may have actually resulted in greater digital transformation more than any other force as well. So there's a really interesting mutuality there, um, and it's also again when we think about the evolution of of, of rights con like uh, you know healthcare wasn't even really on the agenda beyond patient rights i would say a few years ago um so to have this like you know tectonic impact um from health and digital and digital back to health um is is really quite extraordinary so um are you just trying to are you just talking to a technically savvy audience and giving us that piece of information or do you actually think that that is the fact that that you know that the digital is going to impact healthcare more than any other force i'd love to hear your response to that yeah it's very important um and i really believe that truly and i i must state that as much as i'm the special rapporteur i'm still a medical doctor in clinical practice um and i had to remember to just take off my stethoscope just before joining this call um, because as it is, I do have patients who are consulting with me virtually. And before the pandemic, um, the policy in South Africa was very restrictive in terms of telehealth and teleconsultation and telemedicine in general. And we've seen with the pandemic how those policies have been relaxed to enable more access um, for patients, not just only information, but to accessing practitioners themselves. And I think those are the types of um, forces I'm talking about, right? is that technology, even in the time of a pandemic, the worst global disaster, is what has kept me closer to my patients and my patients closer to me. And those are the types of policy developments that we need to keep and keep asking ourselves, why, why did we have these very limiting policies in the first place? The other important thing, when you think about the right to health, right? Sexual and productive health rights, SRHR in short, is an integral element of the right to health. And globally, we've seen how women have been able to access um, abortion tablets and medication and information purely because of what technology has been able to provide for them. So it's definitely a force. It's a positive force. We just have to be aware and intentional about eliminating existing um, uh, issues of vulnerability and marginalization within technology itself. Thank you. And, and your, your comments about you know, artificial intelligence not being neutral and, and us having to investigate the you know inherent bias for instance in the data sets that informs the the algorithm uh which of course is rolling out in the provision of healthcare and incidentally i think the stethoscope would have been uh, a welcome addition to 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 the conversation um certainly if i was a doctor i'd be wearing it all the time uh so let's hand let's hand over to um to, to our next um, speaker, Rita. Um, Rita, um, please, having heard the comments from Hardy uh, with respect to, you know, what it's like to be a user and not have vision into the tech sector and seeing decisions being made, uh, outcomes being delivered without actually having, you know, access or entry points into the big tech companies or the, the ISPs or the telcos. Um, please let us uh, into the insight into the, the sort of the back end of, of being uh, a telecom and particularly in a marginalised market. Um, thanks, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, let me just start by saying that I, I believe uh, the Rights Conference this year is more relevant than ever. 
after more than one year where technology and digital access have been so vital to societies all over the world. So, so this is really an important days. When used responsibly, a mobile technology can be a powerful tool to promote human rights and enable sustainable development. However, I must say that telecommunication companies also face human rights challenges wherever we operate. For instance, while the duty to protect human rights, such as privacy and freedom of expression, rests with the authorities, we must not acknowledge that the, the challenges that may arise of authorities excessively using their powers, and we've been touching upon it uh, already today. Let me give a couple of examples. Telenor may receive censorship requests to block access to a website in our market. While blocking sites containing child sexual abuse material helps address a serious criminal activity, requests to block political content, for example, present challenges. Another type of request we may get from the authorities is to shut down the network. Telenor seeks to avoid shutdown of its network and believe that it's in the best interest of the customers to minimize disruption of services. However, in extraordinary circumstances, a government may require a limited network shutdown to protect its citizens from terrorism or other serious safety or security threats. As a telecom operator, it's our duty to respect human rights, including privacy and freedom of expression. It is therefore important that we have policies and processes in place to address risks to human rights and that these policies are anchored at the top. And it's also important that we engage in dialogue with stakeholders to discuss these challenges and to share and learn. We work to engage with stakeholders bilaterally and through local and international platforms, including the Global Network Initiative, to share information and identify potential positive or negative impacts of our operations. This engagement helps us shape, advance and implement our human rights efforts. And what it has taught us through our journey is that we need this collaboration to continuously keep improving. To uphold the human rights principles, companies also need to be transparent about the challenges and company practices to the extent possible. There are regular reporting processes that many companies have adopted, including annual sustainability reporting. Many tech companies, including us, also publish annual disclosure reports, which report on the number of authority requests the company receives. We have also learned in Telenor that transparency is sometimes the only tool we have for mitigating human rights impacts in very difficult situations, due to, for instance, legal or license obligations, or due to the security of our staff on the ground in challenging markets. Transparency can be a powerful tool as it helps us to create awareness around the situation, including in contexts where information may be restricted or limited. It can also support advocacy efforts either on behalf of the company or of the stakeholders, including civil society or governments. Transparency is also key in ensuring accountability for Telenor, but also for other groups. Just to conclude for now, Although I believe that Telenor has made a lot of progress over the years in addressing human rights challenges, we still have a long way to go. And with constant developments in our markets, in technology and in the geopolitical world we live in, we see this as a continuous journey and a journey that we cannot take alone. So I look forward to our continuous discussion on this topic today and in the days to come. Thank you, Rita. Um, thanks so much for that. Um, there's a reason why we invited you into the opening ceremony. Um, and as I said, there's you know 500 companies here. And one of the reasons is, or the main reason is, because we, um, you know, we're looking for best practice. Essentially, uh, we're looking for how companies should navigate these very difficult environments. Uh, and we. Um, and there isn't that much best, best practice, to be honest. You know, it's very it's very challenging and it's very challenging for the tech companies as well. And we understand that. I think it's important for us to see that there's actually a human behind the logo. You know, that there's actually decisions that are being made um, because we actually often just see something that's delivered as opposed to the kind of nuance that happens uh, on, um, on the back end. 
But maybe you can give us a sense, as I mentioned, you and you mentioned you've been the, you're one of the, the four telecoms in, in Myanmar. What, what happens when the phone rings? Um, and you know you're in Oslo, I assume, uh, and and Onibai, and um, you know across the other side of the world, uh, there is a coup that's happened. What what's some of the inter internalities that happen? Um, and um, and I'm in particularly interested in the kind of the the conflict between the upholding of international law and also. Um, principles and norms within Norway and 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 then the application of that in another market with domestic law which isn't necessarily democratically informed give us a sense of like what goes on within the company and how you actually deliver the decisions um, say for instance on something like shut down the internet now yes and as you can imagine uh, it has been challenging months since uh, the coup occurred in uh, in the 1st of February. Our first thought, of course, when this happened was uh, the difficult situation this creates for the people in Myanmar. But as many um, other multinational companies um, operating in Myanmar, we had to mobilize a multifunctional team to support and handle this highly irregular situation. Uh, and and at not least support our local management um, on the ground. And I must admit that we have been facing a reality uh, where we had to balance our principles of uh, transparency with the safety of our employees in the country. And uh, on the basis of the, this, we from the early start had three priorities. The first one, uh, was the safety and security of our employees in Myanmar. The second one was keeping the network operational and accessible for customers and uh, emphasize uh, to the authorities that access to telecom uh, services should be maintained uh, at all times. And the third has been to be as transparent to the extent possible. But as many of you are aware of, the situation has been difficult and we are continuously seeking advice and support uh, from several experts and entities, including the UN and uh, local and international uh, civil society and other peer companies, co companies to navigate in this challenging situation. And we are constantly addressing this and doing what we can to uphold uh, good services uh, in a difficult situation. Mm. I can imagine, and 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 um, well, I can only imagine. I think one of the we've been talking about internal best practice within the companies for a long time, all the way back since you know RightsCon in Silicon Valley back in 2011. Um, you know, we've been pushing, for example, even just now, for Facebook to have a human rights uh, officer uh, on the board. Um, because we believe that it's not just a question of the transactional nature of dealing with, you know, the the shutdown or the request for uh, user data, but it's also the policy that's set from the top and also the policy that's set by the investors as well. Um, Hadi, let me bring you back in to, like, get a better sense from you as to, like, if we look at, like, what's happened, for example, in Palestine just now, but also in, in, in other countries like Colombia, the response was, you know, there's been a technical glitch or, um, you know, there was a sort of some sort of policy issue that overtook um, the kind of human rights decision. I, it's not clear to us what's actually happened in some of these countries in terms of like, you know, content being removed, um, live stream being stopped, um, hashtags being deleted. Um, you know, is there, is there a technical glitch going on or is there a human rights glitch? Um, and and how do you you know how do you having heard Rita speak like what's some of the recommendations or some of the things that you're asking for from the tech sector in 2021? Mm. Um, so uh, right, this is something that uh, definitely we have been uh, seeing. I mean, starting from uh, 10 years ago, uh, the issues when it comes to um, takedowns and uh, the problems what we are facing with content moderation. So it's nothing new. I think what we are seeing right now, it's just like it's, it's huge in scale. 
and that's nearly normal because uh, 10 years uh, documentation of human rights violations is more getting online and more being vitally shared on social media platforms uh, because this is what the human rights defenders mission is to make sure others witness what's happening and then uh, make sure that they, they get the support that they need for accountability, advocacy, justice and so on. Uh, and we have seen a huge peak in Syria when, in, when it comes to content uh, takedowns uh, because we were monitoring uh, most of the accounts that they were publishing this content uh, on social media. So over 5,000 accounts um, and uh, we tracked down hundreds of thousands of videos that were, that were removed. Right now what we see in Palestine is exactly what we have seen uh, in Syria in terms of uh, the scale. Uh, of media that has been uh, terminated. And uh, what we have got in terms of uh, the um, uh, answer from the tech companies, it was a technical error. It's exactly what's happening right now in Palestine, uh, that it was a technical error. Uh, but um, I mean, uh, the, the situation is, is definitely uh, more clear to us in terms of uh, the systematic approach into content takedowns the systematic approach into not really investing as much um, uh, to make sure that um, uh, companies are respecting uh, human rights uh, uh, issues uh, around the world, are investing in resources when it comes to uh, content moderation as well. Um, right now what's happening is that uh, civil society organizations are collaborating more effectively to track down incidents uh, of uh, content takedowns um, and make sure that we have uh, very clear uh, cases uh, and research around it, making sure that we have very clear statistics around it so we can provide it to companies as evidence. Um, uh, because uh, just to counter the argument of a technical error or extremism content. Um, and we, we have that in place, but um, what we've been asking for uh, is uh, definitely we've been asking for uh, opening uh, investigations into those cases that uh, civil society organizations uh, have collected, uh, whether in Palestine, Syria, Colombia, um, and uh, many other countries that are also facing similar uh, challenges. Uh, but unfortunately, content is not being, uh, an incident not being as documented uh, as clearly as possible. And definitely to immediately reinstate all those accounts and content and provide transparency around the decision-making processes. Why did they take those accounts down? And uh, uh, this is what we have been asking for. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the issues that we keep hearing, certainly in this panel, but I hope it doesn't end um, at the word transparency because you know I often feel like transparency is it's absolutely essential for sure, but it's also only part of the story. Um, it does enable accountability, but what we're looking for is actually not transparency into human rights violations. We're actually looking for an end or stopping of those violations before they occur. Um, so, and, and there's many pieces to that, of course, particularly when we start to think about more complex issues that have entered into our agenda from, you know, the algorithm to biometric surveillance um, and just the way in which technology has essentially impacted all, every, all and every parts of our lives. Um, you know, the issue of transparency, yes, like lots of green ticks to that, but we need much more than that. So with that, let me ask you, um, Salang, um, when you, um, when, uh, decisions are being made around health and the provision of healthcare in the context of the pandemic and digital technologies. Um, you know, we we st I think we're we're still in a sort of norms. We're very much at the early stages of a norm setting period, and I'm trying to understand. Um, you know, it's obviously we've seen it in the sort of the areas that that Hardy and also that Rita are talking about. But in healthcare, it's new. Where do, where does where are these norms being set? Uh, is it, you know, is it at the World Health Organization? Um, is it within national governments? Is it within Big Pharma? Uh, how do we, how are we going to ensure that the norms around, um, you know, this sort of massive shift to healthcare um, are are actually rights respecting? Mm. Great question. I think um, there's a lot to be said. I think about having local solutions right and having people on the on the um, 
client facing or rights holder facing side of things to have a seat at the table. I think some of the most frustrating um, spaces I've ever been is where you have policymakers, you have people who are in research and developers and you never find the clinicians or the service providers on those tables. And I think this is such a time where, regardless of what the policy was, you know, and I gave it that example earlier, we had to make things work as clinicians on the ground because we have lives to save. And so you will find that in some instances, the countries or the regional framework is very restrictive and sometimes criminalizing of certain people but you have clinicians and providers who understand human rights and are able to protect and promote human rights in how they practice um, their you know, medicine and in their clinical practice. The other element is that, of course, national regulations um, are important because there are country or geographical um, specific issues and needs. You also have the WHO, which I think for me did a great thing in terms of developing the self-care guide, for example, in SRHR that became particularly useful for this time. You then also have, um, of course, um, the, the health professional bodies, which have a mandate um, to regulate the, the health professionals and how they treat patients and ethics of care. And, and I'm say, unfortunately, even with undergraduate and postgraduate medical training, there is still a lack of a human rights based approach to clinical uh, training, undergrad and postgrad. So there's something to be said there that mm -hmm. we're already finding a lag. And so if you're going to add technology and digital rights onto it, you know, the, I don't think that the foundation is solid. I think there's a lot to be said about continued professional development in, 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 a, in a healthcare setting where it's rights based. Um, and mm -hmm. it's not only something that's spoken about at the development or the design level. It must be everything, everyone involved in the All chain the way of through case. the stacks. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And I'm going to have to draw this um, this panel to a close just because of the, the restrictions on time. The good news is that we've got five over 500 sessions. They're going to drill down into each of the, the items that we've touched on. I think just seeing these issues around um, the fact that so much has happened over these 10 years and yet so much is still the same, um, even with these new developments that are taking place, I think many of the principles are the same. Um, and in fact, you know, as an organisation and as a platform, we talk about the universality of human rights, regardless of whether it's in healthcare or whether it's in democracy or whether it's in education or whether it's the provision of water, that human rights should form the basis of all of those um, discussions and all of those debates um, and, and actually sit at the very centre. Um, I think we're also looking at issues around new norms uh, as we tackle many of these issues, um, the the benefits and also the limitations on transparency is an, a matter that we will discuss um, throughout the week. And also, of course, the role of the tech sector, the fact that it has done so much in terms of the delivery and the enabling of rights, and yet at the same time is causing so many problems. I think we have a human rights crisis that is unfurling. Uh, Within the, tech, within the tech sector and on tech platforms that needs to be addressed. It's no longer business as usual that is okay. And to come back, I think finally, just to close off on Hardy's point, which is about collaboration and around participation. And I think you all mentioned that, that we need to actually work across stakeholder groups, which is exactly the purpose of RightsCon. Um, so, um, you know, it's the place in which to meet people that you would never otherwise meet uh, to be able to get different understandings, to be able to better do your work and also to form those relationships so that they go beyond the five days of rights con and hopefully uh, evolve into meaningful relationships and partnerships going forward. So with that, thank you very much for your time, very much appreciated. And I will hand over to Daphne to talk a little bit about rights con for a couple of minutes and then we'll close up with Javi and Melody and we can begin rights con officially. Thank you very much to the panel. Thanks so much, Brad. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Daphne, um, Participant Experience Coordinator at RightsCon. Some of you may be familiar with me from communicating over email to help answer some of your questions. Um, and as part of my role, I'm here to provide support and just ensure that everyone has the best possible experience. So with that in mind, and before we kick off this week, uh, I just wanted to share a few reminders to help everyone get started and set up. 
As you may have seen, we have many, many things happening on the platform and to help you navigate the content and guide your journey, um, our team has put together a very detailed participant guide with a lot of great resources. Um, and this guide should really be your first um, resource to always go back to and your first um, visit on the platform. So if you haven't already, I encourage everyone to take a look. Um, I'll begin now by sharing a few slides uh, to show you just a few helpful tips. Um, in the guide, you'll find information on how to set up your profile, how to share details about yourself, um, how to set up your time zone so you can navigate the program in your local time. Um, and, you know, like Brett mentioned, with over 500 sessions to choose from over the course of the week, um, the guide also shows you how you can plan ahead. And you can do that by indicating your interest for those sessions that you'd like to attend and build your own personal schedule. Um, in the next slide, I'll show how you can set up your, your calendar reminders, how to set up, uh, set up calendar reminders and include them into your own personal schedule. Um, so this is a great helpful tip because you want to make sure that you don't miss out on all those sessions. So um, there's also information about the many ways that you can engage with other participants throughout the week. Uh, we'll have discussion forums, one-on-one -on -one chats, and group chat functions that are available starting today. Um, in the next slide, I, I just wanted to show and highlight the type of session formats that we're hosting. Uh, we'll have sessions that are pre-recorded and will be available at all times, um, like lightning talks and tech demos. Uh, we'll have sessions with unlimited capacity, like panels and fireside chats. Um, and because of the interactive, interactive nature of community labs and strategy sessions, I just wanted to note that those will have limited capacity and they will close when they reach their, uh, the attendance gaps. But if you aren't able to make it into your first session of choice, not to worry because there will always be programming available at all times and many other opportunities for engagement. Um, if we could, yeah, the last thing on the program here that I wanted to mention is our open spaces, um, which is a new format designed for fun and creative programming. Um, we'll have live performances, film screenings, games, um, wellness and much more. And it's just a site for everyone to connect, relax and unwind. So we hope you will take a moment to tune in and enjoy those sessions. Um, in the next slide, um, you'll see our different channels for contacting support. Um, and you know, as you explore the, the, the platform, you get familiar with the platform, we really want to make sure that everyone feels supported every step of the way. Um, so in the platform, you'll see a section for the help desk uh, that includes information and emails to reach out to for any general questions uh, about your participation or any safety and security concerns. Um, you also find more details about our approach to keeping RightsCon a safe, productive and inclusive space. Um, and on this note, I just wanted to take a moment to remind everyone that RightsCon is governed by our code of conduct policies. And these policies are set in place to create a safe, a safe space, one that is free of harassment or discrimination. Um, and in there, you'll be able to read in more detail about our policies and how to reach our code of conduct team for any questions or raise any concerns. Um, and finally, I just wanted to remind everyone that similar to previous years, there will be lively discussions happening simultaneously over social media. So I encourage everyone to join and follow the conversation using the official hashtag, which is hashtag RightsCon. Um, and I'll end with that, as I'm sure everyone is very eager to get started. I hope everyone has a very productive week. And now I'll pass it over to Melody and Javier to kick us off for our 10th anniversary. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Daphne. And yes, I mean, after all of these uh, uh, different kinds of panels and sessions and events that are available at RightsCon, I have to say I feel a bit overwhelmed. I've just indicated interested to clashing events, so it's going to be a real experience for me in terms of decision making uh, and also making sure that um, you know I'm not attending sessions too late in the evening and trying to you know take advantage of this all like around the club type time difference that is going on. Um, so Javi, have you changed your mind in terms of what you're the most excited for this RightsCon? Well, I must say that the most exciting part that I'm intended to explore in terms of technology in these years is how I could be able to, you know, quantumly duplicate myself to just go and see all of the sessions uh, that we can. A lot of interesting issues, a lot of very important discussions. So looking forward to doing that. Um, so everyone, enjoy RiceCon, uh, packed agenda, and have a great week. Thanks.